Good morning and welcome to Iwood Presbyterian on June 20th. Boy, the summer has been creeping along quite quickly and another beautiful day. I can see the sun shining into the church and uh, we have been so lucky. We're having our drive-in service again this Sunday uh, at 10 o'clock. Um, remember 10 o'clock and it's, it's a bit of a time change from our normal 11. But uh, we been blessed with probably two Sundays now in a row with no sun or sun no rain uh, last summer right through the whole summer we did not have any rain in our church service and it was just a real blessing from God you know it would rain in the morning it would rain in the afternoon but during church we were able to have worship service and so my invitation to you come on down if you would like to um, bring your car and park in our parking lot um, and there are a few people that are sitting in their lawn chairs, socially distanced. We've got to obey all the rules that way, um, but you can do that as well. And in the past, people have actually brought their pets with them, stayed in the car. Um, yeah, if you want to do that, go right ahead. Everyone is welcome here. That You'll find that Atwood Presbyterian is a very welcoming church, um, very family-oriented. Uh, if you come to church on a Sunday, you'll see... Uh, multiple generations of families together, grandparents and kids and grandkids, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. And I actually had someone challenge me to, oh, Ernie, why don't you show the sanctuary so people can see it? And so I'm just going to do a little pan there. You can see the beautiful woodwork in the ceiling, and you can see the comfy chairs there, and you can see, well, some of my junk there. But look at the... There's actually a light there that I use to um, show my face up a little bit. Look at the stained glass. Isn't that something? It's not coming through very clear in the camera, but I can tell you that that stained glass is amazing. And right at the very back. Can you see that? Sir, we would see Jesus. And that is a lot of what we do here. We try to be very um, scripturally uh, based. And we're kind of a Bible chased church. So the Presbyterians take um, sermons and scripture study very seriously. So that's another big part of our church. So, a few announcements before we start. Um, we do have a VBS plan. It's going to be a different format. It's going to be a, a box that we give to kids, a box or a bag of craft items and uh, stories and snacks for um, the week. And I think there's four weeks being planned. And we're going to kick it off with a car rally. Um, and I believe it's the second week in July. Um, just stay tuned for exact details on that and have some fun with that. Um, just want to bring us to your attention. Our native monk tonight, Corbin Smith. He's at the Paralympics right now, I've been told. And uh, the Paralympics is going on. And he's a sledge hockey player a very good sledge hockey player and so anyways be sure to cheer him on and I'm sure he's going to be in the news he's he's a very good player um, and just another reminder that in August this church is closed um, and it's been a tradition that we close here and we go over to the United Church and in July the United Church closes and comes over here so August we're closed and I'm going to be on vacation then and of course we'll have some ministers filling in. I believe Sharm Ireland is going to be available for part of that time and Don McCollum is going to be available for the other time Yeah, for any pastoral um, concerns. And the other thing, and this is just kind of for your information, I, I must thank my viewers um, that, that view these sermons online, this worship service online. It, it's incredibly stable. Um, you know, some weeks it's up to 85, and some weeks it's down to 35, uh, depending on the weather. Totally understand. <laughs> you get busy and preoccupied. But I just want to make a point. We had our drive in service last week, and we probably had maybe 20 vehicles. I didn't really count them. Two, three people per vehicle, so maybe 50, 60 people. Um, but we also had another 35 people watch online. So, you know, it was just wonderful that, um, you know, we're revealing this God's message to the world. And I, I just want to thank you for tuning in and uh, 
um, yeah, listening to a word of God and hopefully a message to take home to inspire us for the next week and uh, make sense of this, uh, I'm going to use the word chaotic world that we're living in right now. And we're going to acknowledge uh, the Aboriginal lands that we are uh, standing on. Um, we acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee uh, people, Treaty 29 of 1827, and that we are a treaty people. And of course, we make these acknowledgments. This is part of our healing and reconciliation. Um, a number of years ago, there was 54 recommendations made for um, how to reconcile, how to create healing in the residential school system. And part of that is to acknowledge that we are standing on land that wasn't originally ours. Um, this land we're on is a treaty land. So let's turn to our uh, call to worship. We gather here today with the joys of hearts set free. We come singing and dancing and rejoicing. We gather here today as a family of faith. We meet in the center of God's love where no one is excluded. We gather here today by God's invitation. And we bring our joys and we bring our fears. We bring our success and we bring our failures but we bring all these things to God's open arms. Come, friends, let us worship God together. Please join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, source of life and love, we gather in your presence to wonder at the beauty and the complexity of all you have made, acknowledging how small and insignificant we are, each on our own, Yet you love us with a promise that gives us significance and restores our purpose in the midst of the creation that you love. When we are overcome by forces around us, you speak words of peace. When trouble or sorrow sets in, you give us the strength we need to persevere in our witness to your love. In this time of worship, O oh God, we remember all you have been, all you are and all you will be offering you all praise and honor, love and loyalty with our lips and with our lives to the ends of our days. Amen. Well, I should have mentioned earlier, but you know, today is Father's Day, and um, I'm not going to dwell too much on Father's Day, but um, what is the best thing that dads are known for? Yeah, dad jokes. You know, those kind of sad jokes that kind of groan, really, dad? Well, anyways, in memory of dads, and, um, you know, some dads are with us and some dads have passed away. Uh, so, my first joke, a man said to the Lord, is it true that for you up in heaven, 10,000 years is just like a minute? Well, yes, that is very true. Well, then the man asked uh, the Lord, is it true that a, a million dollars to us on earth is just like a, a penny in heaven? Yes, that's true. Well, Lord, could I have a penny? And the Lord said, sure, in a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad. All right, one more. And then we're done with the dad jokes. So why do dads carry around spare socks when they're out golfing? In case they get a hole in one. <laughs> All right, enough of the jokes. Let's move on to our scripture lesson. So our scripture lesson this morning is Jesus calming the storm. And I, I think, isn't this a very appropriate scripture lesson? Considering the storm that's going around us and, you know, the pandemic and but the pandemic has revealed the underlying problems that we have in society, you know, with the racism and, and the homophobia and, and, you know, all is poverty. And this stuff is all bubbling to the surface. And, you know, we are feeling a little overwhelmed with it. And uh, so the boat is an excellent, excellent metaphor of, um, and the storm of our society that we're going through right now. 
And I also found it kind of interesting. There's a lot of neat stuff in this little scripture lesson. But the one thing that I find kind of interesting is the people on the boat, these were fishermen. These were experts on reading the waves, reading the, you know, sailing boats, getting from one side of the lake to the other. But you notice they go to Jesus, the carpenter, for advice. And I, I just think that's kind of neat. That, um, But maybe they were recognizing that he was more than a carpenter at that time. Ah, we'll get into that a little bit in the sermon. So let's uh, read from Mark 4. And um, the other thing is this particular um, gospel story is found in three other or two other gospels. So this, and that's an indication of how important this story is. So just before this, Jesus has been very busy preaching. Uh, we had those parables of the seed showing that God's kingdom is quite fragile but it can grow into something beautiful and uh, so Jesus is a little tired from all this preaching and so this is where we pick up the story verse 35 that day when evening came Jesus said to his disciples let's go to the other side so leaving the crowd behind they took him along just as he was Remember those words, just as he was in the boat. And there were other boats with him. I never noticed that before, but there were other boats going with Jesus to the other side. A furious, a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. All men, all glory to God, the reading of his holy word. I hear a door opening. I think it's Grace. I'll just yell at her. Hey, Grace, I'm in the middle of recording, so. Not sure if she heard me or not. Hey, Grace, I'm in the middle of recording, so. <laughs> okay, I think she left again. Well, today, as I mentioned, is, is Father's Day. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that topic. But in the New Testament, isn't it interesting how little time is dedicated to the family life of the disciples and the apostles? There's really nothing, there's nothing mentioned about them as fathers. And the fact is especially interesting since the society of that time is patriarchal and since fatherhood is a tremendous responsibility and it has a significant impact on families, kids. We are image bearers of God. Each of us has a little bit of that, just a little bit of that divine spark within us. And as image bearers, we're going to reflect God. But we also reflect our environment, our family, our culture, our society. So it's very important to be self aware of our actions and our attitudes. Because we have a lot of things that are ingrained into us. And, you know, it comes out, and we don't mean it to come out, but hateful words come out just because that's the way we were raised. We've got to be self aware. And be willing to change. And so this self-awareness is what Jesus is revealing to his disciples. That they have to think about their behavior. They have to think about the perceptions of God at work in the world. And how they reveal God. But also to think about their faith. And how their faith impacts their living in the world. As an image bearer, we reflect God, but we also reflect the human dad that we are around. 
If he's a great dad, we reflect that without even thinking about it. Even just basic silly things like laughing at dad jokes or walking like him, having mannerisms like him. And I've often thought there's no bigger compliment to someone to say, you know, you're just like your dad. But it's also bigger things. Our worldview, how we talk, how we interact, how we settle arguments. And I suggest that in our scripture this morning that Jesus is very much a father figure and he is reflecting God. Well, because he is God. Jesus is demonstrating what to do in a crisis of fear. I want to pose a question to you. Why did God create us, allow us to experience fear? It's so much easier if there was no fear in our life, wouldn't it? And fear is an interesting emotion, for it can cause us to freeze and do nothing, and conversely, it can cause us to act, to respond. You have heard the phrase, fight or flight response. Experts have even categorized, categorized fear into three categories. Rational fears, where there is a real imminent threat. Primal fear that is programmed into our brains. Anybody not like snakes? Yeah, that one's kind of programmed in there. And then we have those irrational fears. And those are the ones that we don't make sense, logical sense, and yet can vary from person to person. The one that I don't really get is a fear of clowns. It's an irrational fear. And so I would suggest that fear can be liberating or it can be confining. Fear can be a good thing and allow us to become better people. And yet fear can lock us in a prison and prevent us from being the people who we should be. I remember a story from my youth. I actually looked this up and it was 1972 that this story came to light. So I was pretty young at that time. But there was a story about a man named, and I hope I pronounced this right, uh, it's a Japanese name, Shokoi Yokoi, who spent 28 years in a prison. But it wasn't a prison of walls, but it was a prison of fear. For you see, after World War II was nearing the end, Shokoi was a Japanese soldier on the island of Guam. He had been told to fear the American forces. He had been told that he should never surrender to the American forces. So he was fearing being captured by those forces. So he ran into the jungle and hid in the cave. Well, as he was hiding, he learned that the war is over by reading one of those thousands of pamphlets that were dropped in the jungle by American airplanes, saying that the war is over, come on out, it's safe. Well, nevertheless, he was afraid of being taken prisoner, so he remained in his cave for 28 years until he was found and then he was convinced that it was safe to leave. We all have prisons of fear that we need to break open. In our scripture this morning, there's a lot of fear going around, except for Jesus, who was quietly sleeping in the corner, oblivious to the world around him. When we read the gospel stories in the Bible, you will quickly find that authors use discretion, artistic liberties, making a way, maybe, a better way is, is to describe as artistic liberties. But when determining what stories to use and in what order to put those stories together to write their gospel to reveal Jesus' truth. So the authors of the gospel had unique audiences with unique needs. So when they were writing, when they were preaching, when they were teaching these audiences, the stories are placed in an order and in a timeline to present the message. Some stories included in the gospel and others were left out for unknown reasons. But you know a story is important when three gospels contain the same version of the story. In this case, the miracle of stormy night on the sea being calmed by Jesus. It presents Jesus' power over nature. It presents Jesus' divinity. 
And we can clearly see the need for the scripture. For it reveals that in our fear, in the chaos of life, we need Jesus. And we are comforted to know that God is with us no matter where we are. So the context is important in here. The context of the Mark's gospel is a time of fear and chaos. And we're talking the larger world, the Roman world. It was chaos for the individuals, but it was also chaos for the larger community that was dealing with fear. Mark is writing and weaving the stories of Jesus in such a way so that his audience can find comfort and hope in the truth of Jesus and his resurrection. We all have storms in life, and it's easy to let our imaginations engage with the scripture because a sea storm is a good metaphor for those storms of life we experience. Those events that sneak up on us and leave everything in chaos. So thinking about the sea, it is you know, kind of like the ground beneath our feet is constantly moving. The mass that we cling to is, is moving, throwing us around. In the fury of the winds and the waves, the boat creaks and cracks, and you're wondering, how can we hold it together? And I'm not talking about little gusts of wind, but full-on hurricanes that stop us in our tracks, push us to the limits of what we can endure in life. The need of a miracle to calm the storm, to calm the fear, is a truth that Mark's audience so needed to hear. For that community, the center of the worship of the temple is destroyed. The Romans that came into Jerusalem, pushed back against the Jewish presence there, destroyed the temple. Their cultural and religious center of the people no longer holds. Then there was tension between the Jewish Christians and the other Jewish groups. They were just butting heads. In the midst of all this chaos, when the world was as it was known as ending, we learned a few things about Jesus. Jesus is revealed not as a simple teacher or miracle worker, but as a revelation of God himself in the person of an ordinary human being. It said in the scripture this morning, verse 36, just as he was. What in the world does that mean? Well, I kind of picture Jesus was sitting on that boat just as he was, just as we humans are. Those few words suggest that Jesus, referring to Jesus, suggest that Jesus was exhausted from preaching to the crowds. He needed rest human side of Jesus we learn in the scripture that leaving the crowd behind and following Jesus does not guarantee us as individuals or us as a church or as a community a storm free life Jesus experienced that storm every bit as much as what we did Jesus was there just as he was. Jesus does care for community. And the Mark community would understand this teaching. For boats are a symbol of community. In the ancient world of arts and literature, the Mediterranean world, a boat was a symbol of community, especially a community at risk. And you know, it's the same in today's world. Even today, we use the same terminology. When we have a shared experience of a storm, what do we say? We're all on the same boat. Ever heard that saying? Of course. I've heard that saying many times in this pandemic, but it's not a truth. We are not in the same boat. We're experiencing the same storm, but some of us are floating along just fine on a yacht while others of us are bailing water out as quickly as a sinking canoe that's on fire. Did you notice in the scripture there were multiple boats mentioned? There were other boats besides the one that Jesus was in. What happened to them in the storm? Did they experience the same calming of the sea as the disciples? 
Yeah, they did. We can learn a little lesson from that. Perhaps God's grace extends far beyond our Christian faith boat. A bigger lesson is the fact that Jesus is just as present in the raging waters as he is in the soothing calm that follows. Despite the disciples' inability to perceive it, there is no point in the night when God is absent or even distant. In that vulnerable boat, surrounded by that swelling, terrifying water, the disciples are in the intimate company of God himself human form of Jesus. It's just they don't realize it. When Jesus accuses his disciples, you notice the word I say accused, because when you know they say to Jesus, teacher, don't you care that we are drowning? That's not a question. It's an accusation, a revealing of the hidden fear that is revealed. Jesus, that is not the way things were supposed to go. You told us to get into this boat, and now you're we're in trouble. We followed you. We trusted you. Aren't you supposed to do something about all this? Why are you asleep? The only possible explanation is that in their minds that Jesus doesn't care about them. That's the furthest from the truth. You notice the disciples wake Jesus up by addressing him as teacher, not as rabbi, not as Lord or Savior, Son of God, they are still not getting that God himself is in their midst. No human can calm the storms of life, but God can. God cares very, very much for us. He wants to bring us back into relationship with him. The symbolism behind the story of Jesus' calm in the sea brings great encouragement to us. And it gives us a great hope. The crises in life have often been compared to stormy seas. Storms will come, but we are never alone in the midst of our fear, our uncertainty, our suffering. When we preserve, persevere with Christ, we can, we will overcome. We need to focus on Jesus, not the storms and the battles of life. As a church, we need to continue revealing the gospel message to the world that Jesus, God himself, is with us. That's the answer. We can't do this through our own human frailty. Jesus has power over the storms of life. And in his humanness, he's experienced them with us. He loves us. He saves us from them and wants us to trust in Him. That is His message throughout the Gospel. There's another teaching of Jesus. A few more words, encouragement. Jesus said in John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. This peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The peace Jesus gives does not come from the absence of storms. As long as we walk upon this earth, there will be storms that come our way. The peace we receive comes from the knowledge that Jesus is with us in the storm. He never leaves us. He walks with us. Amen. I will invite you to join me in a word of prayer. God, in whom we live and move and have our being, as we consider the world around us in your presence today, we are grateful to know that you are near, that you are with us. 
and that your presence will not fail us no matter the challenges we face. And we are aware of so many challenges, such chaos, such turmoil in our own lives, in our communities, in the lives of those we care about, the world around us. We wonder how you reveal yourself, your mercy, your love and response to so many needs. Help us trust that you'll never give up the situations which we find overwhelming. In faithful silence we lay before you the concerns in our hearts this day. We pray for those that have been in the headlines this week. We pray for those situations which concern us deeply. We grieve alongside those families who have lost loved ones. And today we especially think of the Shoal family as they grieve. We pray those who are suffering from illness of any sort, coping with pain or an ongoing treatment, for those waiting for or recovering from surgery, for those struggling with economic hardship in these uncertain times. We pray for those who are waiting for something significant, a birth or a death, a trip or a visit, a phone call on Father's Day, a move, a new job, or maybe the moment of retirement. Grant them patience. Grant them peace in this time of restless waiting. We pray for the work of our church and our government in pursuing truth and reconciliation with Canada's indigenous peoples. Empower this work, O oh God. Bless our congregation, its ministries, and the faithful work of our churches in our community. We pray for this community of Atwood. We can see that Atwood is going to grow with a new subdivision. We can see that we have a lot of young families in this town. We can see and witness so much of your kingdom to these people, dear Lord. And help us to reach out to them, to share the gospel message, to let them know that our church is open and willing and loving of anyone who wants to come and it be in your presence. Open the eyes of all our hearts to new possibilities to serve together as we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we come to the end of another online worship service, and uh, so glad that you're able to follow along with us. And my prayer is that um, as we experience the storms of life, some are little storms and some are big storms, but know that Christ is with us through everything. Go with the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.